Okay, the SEC is going to change their schedule. They're going to go to a nine-game potential schedule, maybe eight. We don't know exactly how it's going to look. But one of the main rumored scheduling platforms is three permanent opponents and six regular conference games for a total of nine. Well, the problem with that is that means saying goodbye to a rival. That's hard to think of after 1992, but it's really on the table. This is the Locked On Ole Miss podcast. You are locked on Ole Miss. Your daily podcast on the Ole Miss Rebels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, welcome to the Locked On Ole Miss Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Willis. Thank you very much for tuning in. As you can see below, the Twitter handle is Stephen, at the Stephen Willis. Go subscribe there, follow there, do whatever you need to do. But we tweet about all kinds of fun stuff on my personal account. So there it is. And also, just to let you know, I am a veteran of 10 years in the media game with Rivals.com. And, of course, I worked in the Manning Center for three years. So I was, I've seen both sides of things. That's the reason I'm so confident. That's the reason I constantly talk about what I talk about is all of that is an option. And I just want to translate that for you. Anyway... Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Also, thank you very much for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first and listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Do us a favor subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell for notifications and new videos when they're posted, which is quite frequently, and of course, upvote the video itself. If we had 1,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel, we will do post game live and post game live is going to be really cool. And we've already saw like the Georgia tech game is going to be a two thirty game on ABC, um, a couple of six o'clock games. So there's, it doesn't look like it's going to be too late, which means the post game live could be a lot of fun. So now let's talk about scheduling a little bit. And that is actually a big deal and something that other stations are really harping on as we move into um, June or as I call it, feel still season Um, but you're looking at schedules and the three permanent opponents there's two that's locks absolutely guaranteed is going to happen and that'd be Mississippi State and LSU so the problem lies with the third permanent rival now the importance of this third rival is not that much because you play every team every other year anyway so instead of playing them one year you'll play them next year And over a four-year period, you would play every team at your place. Um, So LSU and Mississippi State, those are absolutely dead on, will absolutely happen. So I started thinking about the fourth one, and I go back and forth with it. And there's um, another way that we could do this as well. But there's three candidates for the third spot. One is Vanderbilt. We played Vanderbilt nearly 100 times. But no, people don't like to claim that's a rivalry because... They're not very good, but it kind of is what it is. You've played that many times, it actually needs to count. So it it is going to go on that sheet of something that's absolutely worthwhile. Arkansas. Ole Miss and Arkansas has turned into a really fun, really crazy game that happens every year. I do not know why, but it's out of control. Absolutely. And the third uh, third chance is for Tennessee. They would probably be the third. We lost them in 1992 when we went to divisions in the first place. Um, They went to the east. We didn't have them because their western opponent was going to be Alabama. So we lost Tennessee in 1992. But that was a game that was played every year. That was a game that was always on the map. And there is an unbelievably tense relationship that exists between Tennessee fans and Ole Miss fans. I do not know why. People are going to blame it on Lane Kiffin, but if Lane Kiffin was anywhere else, it would not be at the level it is now. Lane Kiffin plus Ole Miss equals mustard and golf balls being thrown. It's pure and simple. They they don't really do anything about it, but it is what it is. Tennessee fans think they're better than Ole Miss. I think think it's a Memphis thing because half of the fans, they go back and forth all the time and they never play. And we're at the point now that Tennessee has not beaten Ole Miss since 2010. Think about that. Since 2010. So by the time the next time they play, it will be 15 years from the last football victory that Tennessee had over Ole Miss. 
And that includes the year before, doesn't include the year before when Dexter McCluster ran for three and a half miles. But that is an interesting game that probably could get played and should get played, but it probably won't. But I put it on the list anyway. Now, if you play a team every other year and it goes back and forth, that means every four years you play them twice, and that'll add a little bit of um, pepper when it comes to the Ole Miss-Tennessee game. Now, it could be a lot of fun. Now, Arkansas. That is an absolutely weird game. It has just gotten absolutely weird. 2015, fourth and 25. Last year, the two-point conversion that didn't make it. Um, the um, year before that, the Matt Corral six interception game. Before that, you've got the Chad Morris stuff where Ole Miss was able to pull that off. It, it's an interesting situation. It, it just is. And that game has become just entertaining, honestly. And because of that, I look at it as a way that um, – you, you want to see that game every year. So that's the reason they're on the list. Now, Ole Miss and Vanderbilt, I think if any two teams can say dibs on Vanderbilt when this change happens, it's Ole Miss and Tennessee. Those are the two that fight Vanderbilt all the time. They play um, almost every year, and they have since, I think my whole life they've played every year. I don't know if they've missed. And... Because of that, Vandy's able to beat Ole Miss from time to time. It's a big game to Vanderbilt because it's a game they think they can win usually, even though whether they can or can is absolutely irrelevant. But they think they can. And because of that, I mean, it could be a little bit interesting. You're going to get a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of a higher level effort than you would with a normal team. If you played Vander every, Vandy every five years, you would not get the same level of effort. And the game, because of that, it has been known to get a little bit weird, a little bit wonky. And it's a game that probably should be set on the schedule. Now, if I could pick three teams, just me pick three teams, it would be um, Mississippi State, LSU, and Tennessee. Those would be the three permanent opponents. And the rest of them, you know, you play Vanderbilt every other year just like everybody else. You play Arkansas every other year just like everybody else. And you kind of live with that. That's probably what I would do um, with the Ole Miss part of this. Now, coming up in the next segment, in the next segment of the show, you will hear what I would do with other schools and some interesting things that might come up. And I'll talk about that a little bit. And also, we have Tom Vanderford coming on um, this afternoon. If he can make it, if not, you might have somebody else. But I'm feeling I'm filming this a little bit early, so we have that coming up right down the line as well. Our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. Find all the latest odds, news, sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, major league scores, fights, and even next season's NFL futures. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. As you can see below, Ole Miss is opening up as a 21.5 point favorite over Troy. The over-under at BetOnline is at 7.5 games. And more and more lines are going to come out with BetOnline as this goes forward. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and actions. You know, BetOnline, where the game starts. Thanks for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. The biggest stories of the day, instant reactions, big game recaps, and of course, the take of the day. It's available on Audacity, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. In the first segment, we talked about um, how we would do the future scheduling in the SEC with Ole Miss. Now let's kind of look at the other teams in the conference and interesting things that could happen. Now we start with Alabama is going to have Auburn in Tennessee. That is just going to happen. It's the third one that could be interesting. I've seen people call for LSU. I've seen people call for Mississippi State. And I think Mississippi State could be that third permanent rival for Alabama because they've played 100 times. And a lot of this stuff is me talking about teams that have played a bunch of times. There's a lot of history in the game because those permanent opponents, it really needs to lean on that instead of like, 
this game has been good for the last 10 years, let's make it a permanent thing, doesn't really necessarily work. Um, the other thing I'm curious about is Auburn and Florida. Will that be a permanent rivalry whenever they lost that game? Real similar to the Ole Miss and Tennessee game, they lost the Florida game when divisions were created. I'm curious to see how that happens. Auburn has Alabama, Georgia, and will they have Florida? It, it, it's kind of an interesting thing, but that would probably be the three games that historically um, they would like to play. Um, Arkansas is probably the big winner of this expansion. Just absolutely. They've been a rudderless ship for 22 years. Now, what do I mean by that? They essentially have no had no rivals when they came in. It was like the new kid that moved into town and was forced to go into the lunchroom and they had nowhere to sit and they tried to force partners in different places. You've got the boot with LSU. You've got the border war with Missouri, but none of them really stuck. Stuck. You had A&M, and there was a rivalry with A&M a little bit, and they play in Arlington every year, and that's kind of the biggest rivalry on their schedule right now. But when this happens, move over, because their original OG rivalry is coming into the Southeastern Conference, and that is the Texas Longhorns. There's nothing that people from Arkansas like more than beating Texas. So you could have a situation to where their rivals are set up, Missouri, LSU, those two force rivalries, and Texas. Pretty cool. Nice, decent little thing. And it should make Arkansas football fun. Now, the problem with Texas is it could be at the expense of the Ole Miss-Arkansas game, which, like I said, has turned into a little bit of a fun thing. Tennessee, I think Tennessee-Alabama, I think Tennessee-Vanderbilt, and then there's that third one, which I would do Ole Miss – but Florida might show up in there. Florida, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, Florida, Auburn, boom, done. South Carolina, Kentucky, South Carolina, um, Missouri, um, South Carolina, somebody. You know, whenever you do all that, it's not going to be perfect, but there are some historical matches that make a little bit of sense. And in doing so, you might find yourself in a position to where you have a chance to make your schedule pretty fun every year with your permanent opponents. So these permanent opponents are going to be fun. Everybody talks about, well, are they going to make a permanent opponent for Alabama Vanderbilt? I don't think so because there's no history in that game. I think those three are going to be historic. They're going to have to be. If you're going to do it every year, it's going to be by your fan base's demand. It's going to be about their fan base's demand. Ole Miss and LSU is happening every year. Ole Miss and Mississippi State is happening every year. There's no doubt about that. It's the third one that's going to be interesting. Mississippi State. I sat down and tried to think of permanent opponents in Mississippi State. And um, you have Mississippi State and Ole Miss. And then what? What's the next biggest game for Mississippi State? I'm not making fun of them. I just don't know. I know they put in all of their eggs about Ole Miss um, during the season. But is that their season? I just don't know enough about Mississippi State other than the fact that I can't think of anything. They play LSU every year. They play Bama every year. I guess they've played Bama a bunch. So that could be the second game. The third game may be Kentucky. I, I don't know. It says it's a shot at them. It's just weird that whenever you're looking at permanent opponents of teams, it kind of just at least two roll off immediately. It doesn't matter who it is. Even somebody like Missouri is like, okay, Arkansas and Oklahoma. Boom. You know, they played Oklahoma 90 times. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, Texas and Oklahoma, Texas and Arkansas, Texas and Texas A&M. Boom, there's your three. Just wipe your hands, you're done. And that's also three amazing content items for ESPN, by the way. You know, Alabama, Auburn, Alabama, Tennessee. Who's the third game for Alabama? I'm not sure about that. That's going to be kind of up in the air. Georgia Bulldogs, Georgia, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina. Um, what's the third game? So this three is a nice thing. And the reason it's three, by the way, and nobody will say this. It's like, how did you get to three? Well, that's because the game, once you don't have permanent opponents, there's enough of them to where you play six games every year. You can play a full SEC schedule in two seasons. So three permanent opponents, you know, 
It, it's a nice, even thing, and easy to schedule. Three makes that possible. Now, lots of schools have two permanent rivals that you can think of right off the top of your head. The third one could be a little bit of a reach. It doesn't matter if it's Alabama. It doesn't matter if it's Auburn. It doesn't matter if it's LSU. LSU, I think, is um, Texas A&M, Ole Miss, and, you know, potentially Alabama, potentially Arkansas, um, potentially Oklahoma. Something in there. But this is a real fun discussion. I mean, when you think about what goes on with scheduling in the Southeastern Conference, because it is a hot-button issue. And this is going into the weekend thing. And you have all weekend to talk about it. So I wanted to talk specifically about how this could look on the weekend. And you can take time to digest it. And you can put t- comments in the comment section below about what's going on and how scheduling could be just a real, real thing that could be instrumental to teams. I mean, you know, Arkansas has played at Vanderbilt, I think, four times since 1992. It's always been quirky in the SEC. Georgia has not been to College Station since Texas A&M came into the league. Always quirky. But if they do this, this three and six thing, you have a situation to where you can play at every school in a four-year period. And three of them you'll play twice at their school. So I think it will be pretty cool. I think it could be cool. I'm, I'm, I've been team um, keep the divisions and eliminate permanent opponents. Just move Texas and Oklahoma and Missouri to the west. Move Alabama and Auburn to the east. No permanent opponents. You play... Um, Play each team every four years because you have two um, Eastern Division teams, non-conference games, seven divisional games. So those two, you can just rotate through them in a four-year period. So Alabama and Auburn, you'll play them once every four years if you're Ole Miss. So that's my idea, but I like this three and six thing. It kind of makes sense. It's it's perfect for a 16-team league. Now, the problem is... And we'll talk about this a little bit next week with Price Coon. What happens if the LSU or the the SEC pulls the trigger on the SEC only playoff? Because what that means, it's not going to be a 16 team SEC only playoff. It's going to end up being a 24 team, 2016, 2018 league, to where we're taking your best. USC, come on down. Ohio State, come on down. The ACC, we're just going to rip apart. That's what it would look like. So, I asked him, and you'll have to tune in next week for that, but um, he'll be on Wednesday. But would Georgia Tech try to coattail Clemson and North Carolina and Florida State and Miami into the SEC? Because if they do this SEC-only playoff, those four teams are gone. Will Georgia Tech, being the power in Atlanta, um, be the person that would coattail in. So we talk about the, all of that with scheduling and everything going on because the SEC is kind of at an interesting crossroads. And it's great for me, honestly, because, you know, anytime I'm talking to somebody, you know, oh, no, 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 Steve, that's not the way it's always been done. And it's like, okay, I can quit listening to you because the way things have always been done are not the way they're done anymore. All the stuff that has been done for 40 years is completely thrown out the window to the point where coaches and players are now one-year transactional players. And the relationship between players and the fan base is absolutely going to change. It's going to more resemble what players and the coaches look like. And there's still boosters that are trying to collect players and trying to collect coaches that they can call as their friends so they can be insiders and have the words um, all of that about it. And, and it's just not going to happen. There's not going to be the longevity that you're used to. There's going to be so much turnover, and it's going to drive them crazy. So I'm actually here for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. But expect a much more transactional experience. Expect universities to compete against NIL, NIL collectives. That's where this goes next. Ole Miss is trying to renovate facilities on campus. Collectives are trying to buy players. Um Lane Kiffin talked about collectives in an article. They're going to compete against each other. And 
you're going to see that the ego buys that people have, you know, if you go to the Ole Miss thing, you have the Craddock Court or the Sandy Black Pavilion and all that, those ego donations, those are going to go to NIL. But what happens whenever the player doesn't work out and you automatically lose any power that you have? These people don't make a ton of money by giving it away, by throwing it away. So if it turns out to be a bad investment, it's going to backfire a little bit. It it just is. So that is going to be a whole lot of fun. When we come back, Tom Vanderford is going to talk about Ole Miss sports, and we're going to have a little, little bit of fun there. So stick around for that. All right, thanks for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including iTunes. So don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes. Give us a five-star review. You can say whatever you want to say. Just give us a five-star review. I'm here with Tom Vanderford. He's back. He's back on the show for his weekly feature. and We're going to talk schedule, and we're going to have a good time today. How are you doing, Tom? Doing great, man. How are you? Oh, man, I, I I am almost done with the renovations, so um, yeah. that's going to, yeah, I'll be happy about that. So Good deal, um, good deal. Yeah, so um, let's talk about the 3-6 schedule module. Basically, the three permanent opponents and six SEC modules as a potential. The other one's a 1-7. I think that one was put in there to fail just so there was they could say there were options for the three six thing. But I think the three six right. thing is gonna come through. My thoughts in like an ideal world, I think that obviously Mississippi State and LSU, LSU at Halloween also. The yeah. third one, Tennessee. I like that. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like of of course, you know, I, I I'm always uh, looking for the, uh, you know, the the easier foe, and you know, Vandy's been a permanent mm-hmm. opponent out of the East forever. But you you know, uh, with this new world of NIL, I don't really think you're going to have any, you know, any cupcakes anymore in SEC. I really don't. Um, I, I just got off the phone um, with Bryce Kuhn from Georgia Tech. I interviewed him for a show next week about the Georgia Tech game and everything. But we talked about whenever their body says SEC only playoff, they assume they mean SEC with 16 teams in Texas and Oklahoma. But that's not what they mean. It's going to be an SEC playoff with 28 teams, with 30 teams, with all the best of your conferences teams in the new named SEC that is going to function like the NFL. Um, but it I all, think so. Yeah, it all starts with the three six thing. But there's down the road. I I see like USC, UCLA, Oregon, Washington, Ohio State, Michigan. All of them will be collected under this umbrella um, and have a chance to be big time football. And like I think you were the one that I noticed that said it on Twitter, and I agree. The NCAA wants to get rid of the P five man. Mm-hmm. There's just too much money involved. They can't control it. You know, they want to just get back to to controlling maybe the 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 G five and you know FB uh, uh, FCS and so on and so forth. Yeah, whenever they went through the Sandusky pedophilia thing and they just completely hammered Penn State and Penn State was yeah. able to um, sue them and get a lot of those sanctions reduced, the NCAA really lost all um, right all te- all teeth. Even the Ole Miss case. It was like 15 scholarships over four years. In 1994, it was 15 a year. Yeah. Right. And But, yeah, they wanted to hammer us, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. um, Because they are so careful with the punishment that they get away from. So they want the Power Five to get out. They want to do G5, FCS, and kind of function how they used to, like 1992. Because right now, the P5 is just running this. They just want them out of there. Yeah. I did kind of laugh at, 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 you know, Saban saying that, you know, that this was going to destroy the parody in the SEC. I, I thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah. Was it 15 out of the last six years the national champion um, has either beaten Saban or was Saban? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's parody. <laughs> parody, yeah. That's <laughs> See, and I think um, – that's one of the great things about the transfer portal and NIL, NIL. Because the way it was set up before, there were five teams that could recruit to the playoff. You had Alabama, you had Clemson, you had Ohio State, maybe Oklahoma, maybe Clemson. And they're just 
stocking year after year recruiting to that playoff. And there was no other way to get around it. So the top 50 players in the country were going to those, top, those five teams. And the gap was widening between teams. But now with the NIL, um, the top 50 is spread out. And with the transfer yeah. portal, the top 50 is spread out even more um, because of what's oh, yeah. available and, and, and talent. So it actually is going towards parity. Everybody's freaking out about NIL, but NIL might be the way for us to get to parity. I think so. I think so. I, you know, I, I, I really, I, I really think that it's going to benefit teams like Ole Miss mm-hmm. that are proactive in the portal and that, and that they, you know, they don't, we didn't go out and get, I mean, what Zach Evans was a star, obviously. Uh, there were more that, that guys that we got dart and trig that were stars, but we got, you know, we got, you know, the, and I can't think of his last name off the top of my head, but the, the tackle from Western Kentucky, Mason the, Brooks, the line, right. Mason Brooks. And then, uh, we got the linebacker from central Michigan. I mean, these were guys that are going to be contributors, guys that are probably going to play on Sundays. Yeah. And, and you know, we, they like digging for that, those little nuggets, you know, it, they didn't necessarily, they, they never were in the game for the, for the LSU defensive guy, uh, Ricks, I think they were never, yeah. they never even tried to get him, but you know, they got, they got Tysheen, uh or Ishim, mm-hmm. Ishim Young, who, who, who fits our system. They got, uh, uh, the, uh, the kid Kari from Auburn Coleman. that fits uh, our system. Yeah. You know, and and you know, I just uh, they they really didn't they really didn't ruffle any feathers. They got kids that the other teams wanted to keep, but they didn't ruffle any feathers. Yeah, and the thing about it is the transfer portal transfers have such a negative connotation in our society. So it's going to take a couple of years for this transfer portal to actually expand and be bigger than it is now. But they go out. They got both co-defensive players of the year out of Big Twelve in twenty twenty. You know, our big freshman of the year, right? Right. And I see Young and Kari Coleman, um, JJ Pegues, a hometown kid that wasn't even looking at Ole Miss in um, 2020 or twenty nineteen, twenty twenty. Um, yeah. And Ladarius Tennyson, who is basically a Jacob Springer clone. All of these yeah. guys, they they've expanded the talent on the roster to. They went to the Sugar Bowl last year with 17 players that were four or five star on it. Right now, they're sitting at about 30, 32, something like that, somewhere in there. And the transformation of this roster is just absolutely phenomenal. Nobody's talking about it because they don't want to. They don't. They don't right. want to do that because they don't want people to be excited. Um, everything is, I don't know, so, so negative in recruiting. But it's okay to be hyped up about this group. If they don't hit as where you want to go or what you're expecting, that's okay too. It doesn't really matter. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, and, and the national media, they, they you can tell that they really aren't cued in to the whole Ole Miss thing. I mean, I, I saw where they've got Jackson Dart picked as fourth in the Heisman race. And uh, he might not even start, you know. I mean, if he gets it together and he has a Matt Corral experience a la 2020, uh, he, he very well may, uh, you know, he very well may start. But right now he's, he's got to calm down a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and, and like I said before, I, I'm, 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 I'm for what's best for Ole Miss, and and in that spring game, I you can't pass up the fact that Kincaid Dent looked the best of all three of them. Oh, don't do that, man. That's my opinion. Whenever I was at Ole Miss working there, we had a um, running back that three straight years ran for a hundred yards in the spring game and never took one snap during the fall. Well, now I believe that <laughs> I believe we saw some running backs in this spring game yeah. that I don't say Isaiah Woolard looked great. Yeah. And I doubt if he gets a lot of snaps this year, unless yes. we get a lot of injuries. So there's not really you know, a whole I mean, lot you can ever take from a spring game. Just I tell people yeah. all the time, just be excited that you get to see the players, these new players play. Yeah. 
Uh, but yeah. don't, and don't you're right. Here. I mean, yeah. Seller Shy is not going to catch a touchdown pass this year. Yeah, chances and, are. Yeah, and people are um, <laughs> people are losing their mind because the four man defensive front it was out there, and it's like, well, last year it was all four man defensive fronts because that's what yeah. they were running, and we didn't run it at all during the season. You can't tell. You only put stuff on film in the spring game to make people prepare for it. Waste time. And exactly. Yeah, it, and they they don't quite get that. They want they want it to be the end all be all, but they just don't yeah. know how to watch it. Right. It's just it's uh, spring games vanilla. Hmm. Uh, it's vanilla, and uh, you just you just take away good performances. I thought. Yeah. I. We've talked about this before, but Triggs is a stinking monster, man. Mm-hmm. He's a he is a game changer. Yeah. If you look at the spring game, Michael Trigg was with Jackson Dart on one side. The other side was yeah. Zach Evans. We don't know who the slot receiver is going to be, and that's going to that's the main portion of our offense. It was all split up, so you can't really judge the offense because all of them together no. they can do different stuff than all of yeah. them spread apart. Well, I don't. This is just my opinion, but I don't think our starting slot receiver in the fall played in the spring game. Potentially, Jalen Robinson absolutely could take that. Uh, but yeah. do not. Everybody wants to give up on JJ Henry for some reason. Do oh not, no, he did do, great. Yeah, do not count that kid out. Everybody's like Jalen Knox oh. or Jordan Watkins no. or Jalen Robinson. Saw a lot yeah, and, of, I saw a lot of Elijah Moore and JJ yeah, in, yeah, in the spring game. He, that kid know, was the most impressive receiver we recruited that year. Yeah. Oh, he was. Hmm. He was, and he didn't. He didn't. Uh, he didn't get rid of his eligibility as a freshman last year, so he's a redshirt freshman this this season. So, uh, Jay, you know that's that's good, you know. And uh, we just we you just keep going, Braylon Brown. We've got all kinds of um, weapons. The funny but thing I is, I do believe. Go sir, ahead. The funny thing is that. Um, the people that don't really know what they're seeing and don't know really know what they're talking about, they're always talking about the outside receiver production. What's wrong with these receivers on the outside? We need to find outside receivers. And it's like, no, 90% of the offense is played in the middle of the field because in, the conflict in players the are in the hashes. middle of the field. Yep. The outside guys in are glorified blockers and double yep. move guys. Yeah. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the passes this year are going to be caught by your, by Trigg or the tight end, whoever that is, mm-hmm. uh, the slot guy, and the running backs out of the backfield. Mm-hmm. That's exactly, uh, and I've, I've noticed that's on the safe. Um, that's the safe move. That's yeah. the safe move, right? Yeah, I've noticed on Twitter the last couple of um, days that they're putting up um, Charlie Weiss coaching clinic stuff. About Ole Miss and Air, you know, and so Ole Miss and Arrow routes, and yeah. that's really really interesting because that gives you an idea of what they do and the way they can scheme it up to where plays that are normally run on the one and two yard line they're running it on like third and seven at midfield um, and getting those tight ends wide open and it's very pro concept, yeah. but it's designed to look like a typical spread thing and. It allows you to just mess with those defenders, man. Oh, he's – he's look, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that Lane Kiffin got the guy he wanted. I'm sure in his mind he upgraded everywhere. Uh, so, I I'm to looking break forward it. to it. I hate to break it to Sorry? you. He, he was never going to hire Jeff, um, him to be on the staff as a quarterback's coach behind Jeff Levy. Because Jeff Levy was always getting the job. Because you come here, they run the Baylor stuff. The Baylor guys know how to put that in. So they want exactly. the baseline of that. That's the reason Joe John Finley yeah. was here, Randy Clements, Jeff Levy. There's There was a method to the madness. But yeah. it's also no doubt to me that the next offensive coordinator that was going to be hired was Charlie Weiss Jr. Yeah. and He's brilliant. Th- yeah. Th- if there could have been a co-OC and they could have gotten away with that, Charlie Weiss Jr. would have been Jeff Levy's co-OC. But they didn't want to do that for recruiting purpose, however. They, they wanted him to go out on his own and do whatever, but his suit, it was known. As soon as Jeff Levy's gone, this job is yours. It, it was all in the plan. The same thing with Chris Partridge. After Chris Partridge leaves, which might be after this year, 
Maurice Crom is in position to take that job. Yeah. And and Crum. they're doing this yeah. intentionally. There's going to be high turnover in SEC yeah. football, and this is a way to combat that. That is right. That is right. And uh, I'm man, I'm telling you, I'm just I'm really looking forward to the fall. I think uh, we're gonna think we're gonna and I this, we've said it before, but the schedule sets up great, and uh, we've got depth at most places for the first time in a long time. Uh, so probably my life ready to rock and roll. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's been since the early '60s since we had this much depth on our football team. And it just has. I completely now, I, agree. Yeah. yeah, I'm not saying we're going to go 10 and 0 or 11 and 1 or whatever that is. Oh, me neither. But the I, but the talent's yeah. there. Yeah, it's one thing to be talented; it's another thing to be good. But this is this is an extremely talented football team. Yes, sir. All right. Thanks for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen today. Now make your second listen: Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. Raphael Barlow, Richard Strayman, Sam Ferris, and Leif Thulin give fans an in-depth look at the biggest prospects, the latest player rankings, and, of course, big boards. Follow the Locked On NBA Big Board every day on the Audacity app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. Tom, always a pleasure, man. I look forward to talking to you next week. Yep. Thanks a lot, man. Take All care, right. buddy. Hotty toddy. Hotty toddy.